Hi everyone, uh, my name is Soraya Nadia McDonald. I am the culture critic for The Undefeated and a contributing editor at Film Comment. And thank you so much for watching a conversation with Leslie Odom Jr. as a part of the 33rd, as a part of the 33rd annual Virginia Film Festival. Um, so Mr. Odom, <laughs> Uh, what a pleasure it is to be speaking with you. Thank you so much for being here. I feel like you're having uh, you're having a year similar to mine in that in a in a very strange and trying time. There are these wonderful, you know, these wonderful little gifts that we're that we're getting from from the universe, from our peers, from the business, saying telling us that we're on the right path. But I wanted to congratulate you. On, on camera too, because you're, you are, I've been a fan for a long time, but I love seeing you recognized in this way. It's really amazing. Thank you. Oh God, you're good. Oh God, okay. I... <laughs> I know. It's embarrassing, I know, but you're about to embarrass me, so you deserve it. You, I, you're, I'm sure you're about to say some things that are gonna make me blush too. But just, I, I'm, I'm just guessing that from the little conversation we had before this, I think you're gonna say some things that you know, that I'll feel the same. Yeah, way. yeah. Well, I am I am so happy that your talents seem to be being embraced even more. I mean, like truly, um, you know, when I, it, there's such a, how do I put this? Like, it's so evident in your performances, um, you know, how much thought that you put into your craft and these characters um, and the way they are differentiated. I mean, your, I think, you know, your performance of Aaron Burr, which, you know, which folks are so familiar with now because um, they can stream it, <clears throat> you know, it's, it really is built from the inside out. Um, you know, this, this character, um, you know, from the physicality to his voice, everything about him, you have sort of given these attention to these minute details. Um, and of course, now you've done the same thing with Sam Cooke in One Night in Miami. Um, so like, first off, I am just curious, um, you know, how long you know, counting rehearsal and everything else, were you sort of like in that mindset of being Sam Cooke? Um, and yeah. and what parts of him, you know, still remain with you now? Hmm. Um, I'd say for preparation, um, before we started shooting, I probably had about, about six weeks five, six weeks, maybe I'm probably being a little generous. It probably wasn't quite, um, but somewhere around then, like five weeks. And it was right around, it's also right around the holiday time. So, um, but it's, and it's, I should also say, it's not, it's not five weeks uh, where I'm solely getting to, you know, go away to a cabin and prepare for this role. You know, usually my calendar I prepare my calendar in normal times. I should say, you know, everything's changed for everybody. But in normal times, I fill up my calendar <laughs> with um, writing assignments, speaking gigs, concerts, you know, the, the things that I have control over. So my calendar is full, whether nobody, you know, if anybody calls me to be a part of a project this year or not, I know that I'm going to be working, that I'm taking charge of my creative engine inside me and um and it you know it, i learned a long time ago as a performer you have no control of when that phone rings so you better you know make it your business to um to stay busy and, and stay creative in the meantime so you know it's all the meantime so whenever i get offered a film i haven't quite figured this out you know it essentially all of that, the time that I had planned on the cal calendar for family time, time with my wife, time with my kid, time with my friends, that all goes away. That gets gobbled, gobbled up by a film. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's 
it's a sacrifice to my family. It's quite frustrating to my wife, as you can imagine, because the, these are wonderful things, but you know, the, the calendar's filled up already and then a film comes and takes all the rest of the time. So um, when I got Sam Cooke, it was right before our Christmas break, which you know, my wife was like, okay, I know that I get you for, I know that we get you for four weeks, you know, three or four mm -hmm. weeks around holiday time, we're gonna have your, your undivided attention. And that was when, that was the time that I had for Sam. So, um, challenging but you know she my, my wife was very gracious <laughs> and uh she knew how important it was and so she uh, allowed me to make make the space and then really you're preparing also uh the whole time you're shooting i mean it's it's really not as if the work the, the work stops once you shoot right i mean i we were all getting incrementally better day by day so i know you know like the the final scene for me in the film was one of my final days of shooting, if not my final day in New Orleans. So ah. I, I certainly felt like grateful for the schedule, the way that it was designed, because it was a big scene for me. It was to, you know, probably the scene I was most fearful of. So to, to have all of the shooting days behind me, to have even the, you know, that practical time that I had spent walking around with Sam and li you know, living, bringing him as close as possible, he was never closer to me than he was on the day that we shot a change is going to come. So, um, so I have to include the shooting time as well in the preparation, you know, because uh, every day I was, I was watching those dailies. I'm watching the dailies and I'm, and I'm trying to get better and sharper and just, you know, bring him closer to me every day. Wow. Now that's impressive because a lot of, there aren't many performers, I think, who necessarily like to go back and look at themselves. I, I despise it. Soraya, I, I don't, I, <laughs> I don't like to do it, but I don't know any other way to do this. I don't, I don't know any other way to really get better. This is a visual medium. I'm, I'm telling a story and there are things that I want you to get as an audience member. And I have to tell you what I've learned in this, you know, in my time doing this, it don't always look like what it feels like. <laughs> So, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes I feel like I'm mm -hmm. doing it and a director continues to ask me for something or I watch it back and I'm like, mm, it's not translating yet. And so I really mm. do be, you know, I have to be uh, an audience member too. You know, I, I have to try to, you know, make sure that it, that it looks like, you know, what, what I hope it feels like or something, you know what I'm yeah. saying? I'm trying to marry those two things. So, and I know that there's those actors, right? They don't watch themselves back and God bless them. I just, I don't know any other way to get better, but to watch the work yeah. and be a, be an honest uh, critic of the work and, and make myself get better. Wow. Well, tell me about that. Tell me about working with Regina King as a, as your director. Um, you know, from from what I've heard from other actors, she's she can be very exacting. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you know what I loved most about Regina um, as a director. There are several things, many things. I mean, first, the the hardest part of her job, she, I think she did extraordinarily well, which is essentially the first job of a director is to make sure that we all buy into the vision, that, that we all are a part of the same movie. You know, we're all coming from different, you know, our home situations are different, our training backgrounds are different, what project, what professional experience we have or don't have, it's all different. So we all have a different, we all got a movie in our mind based on the script we read. And it's the director's job because they're on it a lot longer. You know, they're on it way before we are. Actors are some of the last people to be brought on to a film. And they have to very quickly wrap us up into the same vision so that we're all making the same movie. And, you know, we didn't have two months of rehearsal. We didn't have two weeks of rehearsal. So, you know, that has to happen quickly. And 
So that was her first job and she did that really, really well. And that's invisible work almost before you, before you are aware of it. Uh, you know, a director based on the little side coaching that they're giving you based on the environment that they create for you. You know, there's clues telling you, you know, all the time based on the people they cast opposite you. There's clues telling you this is the style of what we're making here. This is what's important here to me. Um, and, and she did that part very well. It was also very evident to to me and to everybody on the set that once we went between action and cut, the performances are the most important part of this uh, process. You know, this, the, she's an actor's director in that way. So all we do all the prep work, the, the beautiful set design, costume design and lighting and all that stuff, you know, where mm. all that stuff is here. But at the end of the day, it is here to service these performers and these performances. We got to have a certain um, amount of truth being told, the maximum amount of truth being told. So there were times where Regina, you know, um, it happened not a lot, but but enough that it was noticeable where you know, this is this movie's being done on a shoestring budget, you know, where we we're deep into shooting. We're an hour into shooting at midnight and the scene isn't working. And Regina's like, we gotta stop. We gotta look at this again. It's not, it's not right, it's not working. Um, it's it's you know, I'm not it's not I'm not feeling it. I mean, that was um radical and um exacting but focusing you know when if she's willing to nobody does that soraya nobody's like yeah you know nobody's like i'm kicking the crew out now an hour into shooting something i got i need the crew to leave we got to start over we have to start shooting this scene again new blocking a new take a new and so it was things like that that let us mm. know what 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 we were trying to achieve with this movie. Wow. Yeah. So you said, okay, so you didn't have that much rehearsal time, um, but you, you know, the chemistry, you know, that the four of you have with Aldous and Eli um, and Kingsley, you know, I think just leaps up, you know, it just leaps off the screen. It's, it's really evident. Um, you know, and I don't just necessarily mean that in terms of like positive chemistry, but also, you know, when you, when Sam and, and Malcolm are really sort of sniping at each other, um, you know, you, you feel it. Um, you know, tell me about, tell me about creating uh, that chemistry with the, with the three of them. Um, well, it's top down, you know, you don't, you don't always know why you were chosen to be a part of a project. Um, that was, you know, was, was Regina's vision. Um, and she chose four men who, um, um, really made space for one another. And there was a, you know, there was a generosity on that set, um, and an understanding, you know, of why we were there. And I, I've worked with a lot of actors and, you know, that they wouldn't always be the case, <laughs> you know, so, so the four of us just had a similar philosophy of, of, of an ensemble of what it meant to be in an ensemble. Um, and, and then, yeah, I, I mean, I can say, you know, really felt as though I think we, you know, it was really understood that the way this, the way Kemp had structured this script that Mike Malcolm was really our leader. And um, Kingsley set the pace, you know, Kingsley really uh, let us know what kind of movie we were making um, with his incredible preparation and his characterization and the, just the work that he put in before we started shooting. I mean, day one of shooting, K Kingsley just laid down the gauntlet and, we, you know, he kind of, um, <laughs> you know, there was just, there was yeah. just no, you know what I'm saying? He, he's extraordinary in this film and you could just, you could just see it in in his prep, in his, in the preparation mm -hmm. that he'd put in for this moment. And so um, when you have, uh, I think, you know, we were all kind of maybe chosen for that, that there, there's no, these three guys, you know, my other three brothers, you know, we're not guys to be, you know, 
pushed aside. You know, we're not guys to be yeah. left either. And so, yeah, when when we saw what Kingsley was doing, it you know, very quickly you realize, you know, well, okay, we have to. That's that's our bar. That's our bar. You know, we have to rise to meet this brother to 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 give him as good as he's. You know, to give him as good as we're getting, because he was giving us, Kingsley was giving, you also know as an actor, that's an extraordinary gift. When somebody is giving mm -hmm. you so much, mm -hmm. um, literally giving you so much to, to play off of and to work with. And so uh, we, we, had to give it, we had to give it back to him. When, when we were called to, when Kemp gave us the words, because it was so often, you know, a lot of these scenes, you know, Brother Ke Sam's get, Sam doesn't have the words. I literally, I just don't have the words on the page. I haven't been given the material, and so I had to take it. I had to take what Malcolm was giving me as Sam, you know, and 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 consider what to do with it, and you know how I'm going to deal with this, and you know, put it into the other half of the scene. But yeah. Well, so you are someone who has obviously experience on Broadway, you know, and also, you know, in front of the camera. Um, when you are working on something that's that's really merging those two worlds, right, this adaptation of what originally began as a play, um, how does that, you know, how did those experiences kind of combine, you know, in that um, you know, say when you're sitting in the in the motel room, um, you know, because I mean, obviously they're two different traditions, two different styles, um, and it feels like Regina managed to bring the best of both. Like she has these moments where she really just lets the scene kind of breathe, um, and it's it's very sort of focused on their performances. Um, you know, tell tell us about that, and tell us about like because so much of the film is spent, um, is shot in that one motel room. Um, you know, just tell us about the energy of of being in that space with, <laughs> yeah. uh, with these three men, and um, you know, and and sort of threading this this thing, you know, between a play and a movie. Yeah, I mean, it was um, I. I I um I have been making uh the leap trying to make the leap from stage to film for since I left the Hamilton stage you know people were asking me what I wanted to do what do you do after Hamilton right like what do you you know and I and my answer was vague but honest you know I said well I want to do all the things that no one would let me do before Hamilton and that includes film. You know, I couldn't get arrested. Nobody was going to give me a film. You know, I couldn't even get auditions for film for the first 10 years of my career, period, you know? So. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. What, what did they say? It was, um, you know. Like, it is was, it a type thing? Like, it was, that is astonishing to me. It was still at that time a little bit. You believe it or not, you know, uh, early 2000s, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, where it was a little bit still, you were a television actor or a film actor. You know, you mm -hmm. really weren't, you know, movie stars were not doing TV. There wasn't the proliferation of movie stars doing television at that time. And I was um, a television actor. I was considered a, a theater and television actor. And so even for small parts in movies, I just was not seen for them. Or the, every now and again, when I was when I was seen for them, they went to movie actors. So it was fine. I mean, I wasn't. I was. I was just happy to be working, to be honest. So with, with the these early experiences that I've had on film, I just, you know, um, you want them. There's a part of you that wants them desperately, but they're so public. These 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 early, you know, I'm, I'm just learning, you know, I'm just, it is a very different medium. It's a very different craft. It's a different type of storytelling. Um, the rules are different, slightly different. The, um, what sort of rules? Um, 
Well, the main one. There's just a, there's a different type of um, acting. It's just a different type. Yeah. You know, feeling you're you're feeling a different kind yeah. of space. You know, it's in the same way mm. that a, that a movie star is not a guaranteed theater star. You know, we've seen that. We've seen movie stars come to Broadway, and it doesn't necessarily <laughs> thing. don't equal the same thing. A Broadway star <gasps> isn't necessarily a recording artist. We've seen Broadway people try to make music in the pop space and it don't necessarily mean the same thing. So all of these things just have slightly different considerations, slightly different audience expectations that you have to learn and either meet or subvert the expectations in some way. So, um, so that I've just been learning in a very public way. And, I, and you know, and I haven't loved all my work on film. How, I mean, how can you? They're my first, you know, I mean, One Night in Miami is my, you know, only my, I don't know, sixth or seventh movie that I've made. Um, so, but um, the thing that I loved about this is that One Night in Miami 2 is trying its hardest to make the leap from the stage to the screen. And so it felt, we, it felt simpatico. It felt like mm -hmm. I, you know, in the piece, I had um, a kinship in that way. So because it was the marriage, this was the first time I'll say that I was ever on a film set, which, you know, if anybody's ever been on a film set, they, they can be, you know, very clinical, technical um, places, you know, especially when in, you know, when you talk about acting for film, you know, the repetition and the, uh, you know, the, the marks and, you know, just how technical it can be. This was the first time making One Night in Miami that I ever a couple of times had goosebumps while we were shooting it. Never, because we're shooting 13, 14, 15 pages. And so you get to have a run, you know what I mean? As you know, with your scene partners, you can you can forget a little bit about the about mm. the lights and the cameras. You, you know, you get a little bit of that human stuff. And so on the set, I remember like, oof, well, if any of that, I don't know, I don't know, but if any of that shows up on the camera, that felt really great. I don't know if the camera is going to read what, you know, if the camera certainly ain't going to read these mm -hmm. arms, but if it can capture some of that feeling and I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to report that I think it does. It did, the, the film did retain some of that, some of that when it has lift off a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I was, I'm very grateful to have met this film when I did because it's, it's shown me what's possible for, for me and my work in, in the film space in a way that none of the films that I've done before this one have, have shown. Um, oh my goodness, I just lost my train of thought because I was... They'll edit it out. They'll edit it okay. out. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I have my notes on the screen next to me. Um, oh, okay. Can you hear that annoying more mower or no? Like the... No, I don't hear anything. All right, good. Um, I know what I was going to ask you, which is, uh, so you yourself, you are a recording artist. Um, and obviously like your singing voice is not Sam Cooke's singing voice. Um, like what sort of, what technical changes do you have to make to sound so much like him? It's, it's really, it's, I mean, you got it. Like you definitely did. <laughs> He, oh man, I learned, so you asked me earlier what parts of him have retained, um, that stuff has retained, how, how risky and open and honest he was in, in the booth, on the mic, you know, that, I don't want to go back, you know, that, finding that, um, because I'll tell you, um, yeah, all of those songs we recorded that I, because you talk about exacting you know, in the studio. I, you know, I'm I'm Regina King when I'm in the studio. You no, know, I direct myself when I'm singing, and so um, I'm exacting, <laughs> and I'm no fan of myself. Believe me, um, you know, because I know all my tricks, and so you know, I can't I can't fool myself. You know, um, so it was. Um, 
I started there. I started with the singing with in building my in my Sam. He that was my way into even his psychology. I learned about the way he thought and the way he, um, you know, just who he was as a man, as a human being, from the choices he made when he sang, the choices he made as a writer. I was learning about mm-hmm. the man from from that. So that's probably the stuff that I've that I've uh, you know has been most useful to me uh, in in what I do. Uh, but we also had, I have to say, we had a, we had a brilliant dialect coach in Trey Cotton. And I, I've worked a couple times on films, um, you know, dialect, the, the dialect coaches, studios, of course, you know, as, as budgets, and not that this was a studio movie, but productions, I should say, as budgets shrink and people are trying to figure out how to make, you know, these big productions for as little as possible. The dialect coach is sometimes the first thing to go. And, and I fight for it, you know, on, on movies where I really think I need it. I have to fight for it because, um, because their work is, you see, they, you know, they're Malcolm X, Cassius Clay, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown. These are people who have very um, recognizable idiolects. You know, these are very, um, it is, it's like a fingerprint, you know, it's really, uh, and the way we speak, the ways in which we speak, the tone and our, our phrasing, the words we choose, all those things, they're, they're so connected to who we are, to, the, to our upbringing, you know, how much we, uh, what we hide, what's, you know, what's, what the things we can't hide, no matter how hard we try, you know, that those things come out in our, in our, tongue and I speak and so anyway Trey Cotton I have to just give him so much credit he he worked with me and he worked with uh Eli our, our Cassius and, and Trey was just amazing he's also a singer and a musician so he helped me um this was after I had done a lot of the singing but he helped me even approach Sam's you know think about Sam's speaking voice uh you know as a, as a singer you know, think about some of those, some of those things as a, as a singer. So Trey, Trey was a, just a, a um, I owe so much, you know, I think the performance is like, um, it's, you know, probably uh, Regina talks about us as the quadrumvirate, right? These four gentlemen, these four, and the four of us. And, you know, I say, you know, it was like my personal research, Regina King, my scene partners, and then uh, and then Trey. I mean, Trey really helped me quite a bit. Um, you know, there is this really, yeah, I think like there are two scenes that you just, I have not been able to stop thinking about um, since I saw this film. One is the scene outside of the liquor store. Um, you know, the, the conversation about defining power. Yeah. Um, and the other one is is at the end of the movie, is a change gonna come? And in some ways, you know, I was trying to describe it to a friend of mine and I was like, okay, so you know how in If Beale Street Could Talk, like Brian Tyree Henry has this one scene that is basically, it just lays out the stakes for the entire for the entire film, right? The sort of yeah. emotional stakes, like the possibility of what could happen if things go horribly wrong, because you know he's he's been locked up and his soul just gets extinguished, and you can just see it in his eyes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's what that's what that performance at the end of the film provides, right? It's it is this everything that has sort of been building up to this, you know, and these conflicts that you have over, um, you know, really how to be a leader. What our responsibility is. What your responsibility is. It's like, that is the glue. Yeah. Um, but I know there were, I think, so I spoke with Regina in September and she was saying that scene outside the liquor store was actually missing originally like she had to that was when you guys had to basically come back and yeah. and shoot um did you realize it was going to be like that pivotal when you when you did it <laughs> well they all 
felt, you, you know, um, they all felt pivotal. And I, I've learned too that I, I, I don't know about everybody else, but I am best on these projects when when I when my when my real stuff is involved, when my real when there's real stakes for me, for Leslie, you know, when there's real stakes for me, when I'm fighting for something, you know, and I was certainly fighting for we all were, you know, we were fighting for something on this movie. Um, uh, and some of that stuff was simple, you know, just just fighting for the dignity of our of our truth, you know, what Kemp, what Brother Kemp was doing with this script and Regina with her direction, you know, they really wanted, I knew right away, they wanted to, in the way that Manchester by the Sea does so beautifully, you know, they wanted to knock out mm. that wall, knock out that fourth wall and allow an audience to see uh, the interior of this hotel room, but uh, to see the interior of these men, to see um, a more honest version of, of this of this conversation that I've sort of been having, you know, my whole life. First, I witnessed it being uh, it, adults older than me have these similar conversations, and then as I grew up, I started to have them myself. But I I had never seen this particular conversation that's happening in the hotel room, I'd never seen it uh, done on film. And when I read it, I was like, ooh, I see what he's doing. Oh, Kemp, that's, you know, there's something, there's something a little, a little dangerous in that. That's a little, uh, it's a little ballsy. If we, you know, how can we, you know, it's like how much of this thing can we not act? You know, Sam, Sam was a performer. Malcolm knew in front of a, you know, the charismatic, you know, uh, no one was more charismatic or funny or um, there's not a better storyteller, storyteller than Malcolm X was. And come on, Cassius, Jim was literally an actor. These are performers. And in, and so we so that is the way that we know these guys, you know, that we know them yeah. at work. They're at work, they're doing the thing. And in that hotel room, show us something we've never seen of them before. Don't act. Don't perform in there. So I knew in that way, you know, that was that's what I was fighting for in every scene. That's I, I every scene was pivotal in its it, it's like it's pivotal in its casualness. You know, sometimes it is it's pivotal in its like, you know, it's like it's not Sam Cook at work. It's the Sam Cook that he wants nothing more in the world right now than to have a drink and be flirting with some. You know what I mean? And you know, to be around mm -hmm. at the bar, you know, and so like, and so that is important to him right now, you know, for us to see that side of him that we hadn't seen, yes. him, you know, that joy and that, um, that that's what he's fighting for, <laughs> you know, in that mm -hmm. scene outside the bar. So anyway, they, you know, anytime we seen 15, 16, 17, they all felt pivotal for some reason. They were, I knew that, also in the way Kemp had in, uh, constructed that script, that they, they all those scenes where they were there for a reason and I needed to be fighting for something, even if it was just, I'm fighting to get us out of this hotel room. I need to be fighting for something in all of them. There is this, I call it the dignity paradox. Um, and what I mean by that is you can have these historical figures, right, who loom so large because their contributions are so great that there can often be a challenge in playing them, Talk about it. you know, without just making them these sort of like dignified speech givers and, and little else. Um, and, and these men are just, you know, we see them like being human. We see their boyishness, you know, we, their pettiness sometimes, you know, all of those different things. Um, how do you get to the humanity um, of someone who, especially someone who is so famous and revered um, so that you're not just doing an imitation, but you actually are, you know, like you said, like you are, you are fighting for something. Um, so that you don't have that sort of like stiff quality. <laughs> Can I tell you something? 
Um, don't forget that question because I'm gonna go off on a tangent and then I want you to remember, remind me of that question. But it's one of the okay. reasons why it's so important to have you where you sit because um, where you sit, you, you, I think you have many, many important jobs, but as a cultural critic, you, I think, have two, two of the most important things that you do for us is that you can text me something like that. You contextualize our work for, um, for the, I was going to say the wider world, the whiter world, you know, you, you <laughs> doing for, you know, for our non-black brothers and sisters and our non, the, 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 the people that are fans of our work who don't happen to share our experience, our lived experience as people of color. Uh, and I, I've, I've read your work and I, I also love, cause it's a very important job. You, you hold the line for us in that, you know, you talk about the, the what do you call it? The dignity, what is it? The dignity? The dignity paradox. <laughs> right? There's the dignity paradox. Then there's the other paradox. Listen, for people in your position that you know well, where you can feel like you can't critique our work because there is so little of it and because mm. it is because regina is the first she well she's the first and the only and so i can't i have right. to be, right that's your that's your paradox the honesty paradox yes you yes know? wow well i feel incredibly called out right now <laughs> how much true no, you're right you're right can you tell about about our work because that's what can that's what can be so frustrating to me and I, I I've seen you be honest to be frank and I and I'm so grateful for it because you know you can have you can have a respect for the artist and for you know um, our, our our past work and our intention and all that stuff and still tell us when it's not good enough how else are we going to get better how else are we going to you know, so you have to, it's your responsibility to tell us the truth too, as we make these movies. Listen, I, I, I would, it's that, I would love to always make things that you think, oh, he just topped himself again, but I know I'm not gonna always do that. And, 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 and you hold as, as in your space, you hold the, it's the, the history and the, you know, where I, where I am, where Regina is on the timeline and what has come before. And here's, here's how to contextualize it for, again, for that non-white audience, you know, so let me tell you guys what, what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to make, you know, there's that story. And then there's also, you know, and here's what I think about what you were intending to do. So you have this, you have a very similar paradox. You know, we all have that as people of color, we're out here, you know, um, speaking several languages, telling several, several stories. So yeah. uh, I had that same, we had that same, you know, we were facing the same thing, you know, with Hamilton, you know, place it, playing these people who had, who had been statues, you know, who we really mm. talk about as, you know, these statues that we're tearing down in the streets currently, you know, that's the only way that we know them. And so how do I locate the human in their being? You know, how do we present these flesh and blood people that that's going to make them uh, um, relatable, that's going to make just how do we bring them as close to us as, as possible? And so we, we thought about their, you know, Lynn did it first, you know, he, he wrote about their youth and their and their love and their pettiness and their, yeah. you know, their cur So, but with this, uh, so yeah, I, I had done it before and yeah this was no different I, I wanted to play um I thought that the most respect that I could give them the the biggest service that I could do Sam was um was to play him as a human being was to play him as as flawed and beautiful and ridiculous and petty and and uh hot-headed as he was you know, man, if I, the, the more, the more honesty I could bring to him, um, that, that, that was me loving him, you know, that the more I learned about him and the more that I uh, didn't judge him, the more that I presented him as he was, you know, that was the most that I could love him. And, uh, 
and I do love him. You know, I think all, all the guys, you know, we, we, I'll tell you early on, you know, there was, we, as we, as we dramaturged and really, you know, hashed out some of these moments in the script, we had some real heated moments between us. You know, there was some, there was some, you know, never, it never got physical or anything, you know, but, you know, I remember going back and forth with Aldis about, you know, a certain thing like, I can't allow you to say that to him. That has to change because Sam wouldn't tolerate that. You can't, you know what I mean? Or like, you know, we're talking about mm -hmm. this moment. We can't, you know, I, I really don't think that Malcolm can say that and Sam not say this. You know, we had to have those discussions because of, uh, we loved these guys. I remember it was like in our first week in our, in our, at the coming toward the end of our first week when, there was, there was Soraya, there was one exchange between Malcolm and Sam that we had to talk about. And I meant to talk about it for like five minutes. And we ended up in like a 45, 50 minute, like bad debate, full on debate in the cast about, you know, we had to call Kemp on the phone in LA. But after that, I, you know, I kind of like, I, I smiled to say, I, I was fully invested in that argument and I meant every bit of what I was fighting for on Sam's behalf but afterwards I was like oh, I didn't know I cared that much <laughs> Have you ever I, what it's been good for me every now and again I don't realize how much somebody means to me until they're about to walk out of my life and I have to fight to hold on to them or you know what I mean you don't realize sometimes how much you love somebody until it's until it is somehow put in question or in jeopardy and then you discover all those things that you just you didn't need them before you discover all those you know when you you know i remember in europe one time that the early in my relationship with my now spouse you know we're, we're not even a year into this relationship and i'd gotten on a train and the the train, we're in Europe, you know, neither of us have ever been there before. And the train doors were about to close on her. And I threw myself into, I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I, it's just like, it's just a train door, but I threw myself in it, you know, I'm, maybe the thing's gonna keep going, but I was either, I knew that I needed to either get off the train or pull her on, you know, anyway, I was surprised that those instincts were there. I just, I would not have known that they were there until they were needed, but, that's the way I felt about Sam and everybody. We all felt that way about our guys. You know, we, we love these dudes, you know, and I was like, I'm ready to start shooting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, because, okay, it's, it, <laughs> it's been initiated, you know, this, the connection, <laughs> you know, <laughs> here fighting for this guy, like, you know, like I have a real stake in his legacy and what, you know, what people think about him. I cannot be a part of slander. I cannot be a part of letting, you know, letting something go down that's against my guy. Oh, I love that so much. Um, well, I don't want to keep you forever. <laughs> uh, is there anything else that I haven't asked you about that that you would like to add? No, I thought I thought it was a great combo. No, I thought I um, I love that we you know got got into criticism a bit of it. No, I thought it was great. Well. Leslie Odom Jr., thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the 33rd Annual Virginia Film Festival, this has been a pleasure. Thank you, festival goers. Thank you, Soraya. Thanks for having me. And I hope you uh, love, this, love this little movie. <laughs>